The Holy Gospel according to John, the eighth chapter. Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Congregation may be seated. And Ross is smiling this time. I'm going to take his, uh, his music stand, and he knows that I don't mess up his music. So this, he's not looking as scared as he did the first service. <laughs> he's a little bit nervous there. He gladly handed it to me this, this, uh, this service. Would you please pray with me? O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of each heart be acceptable in your sight. Lord, you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, as I told the first service, this uh, in, in good Lutheran tradition or good Luther tradition, um, this sermon's a little longer than usual. I mean, I would say just kidding, but it really is true. However, if I speak too fast, you can always go back and watch the video. We're recording it, so you'll be able to watch it later on. Um, but I did have a lot of things I wanted to share with you this morning. So if you'll indulge me for a few minutes, I'd like to share a timeline that I think is pretty significant for today's lessons and for our understanding of the Reformation, which is what we're celebrating today. By the way, don't you think that wouldn't you love to see the look on Martin Luther's face when he's hearing the music this morning, I think it would be so fun for him to hear that song that he penned, sung like this today. Anyway, so the year was approximately 600 BC, maybe 570, and the prophet Jeremiah had been sent by God to speak to the Israelites. And today we read a short but very important passage in the, gospel, in the uh, prophet's Isaiah, I mean Jeremiah's book, in chapter 31. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, said the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, for the least to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. So Jeremiah speaks here of a new covenant that then becomes incarnated in 600 years. So in approximately 33 common era or A.D., Jesus, who is this covenant speaks at the Last Supper and says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. So as Christians, we believe that Jesus is this new covenant that God makes with us. Through baptism into Christ's death and resurrection, we too are risen in Christ as and because Christ was raised from the dead. This is a time period that scholars refer to as the great transition or transformation. So then we move a little bit forward to the year 476, where the last vestiges of the Roman Empire fall. While Rome and its leaders were major persecutors of the Christian faith at the beginning, they eventually, for some good reasons and for some questionable reasons, became a Christian empire. And that's where Roman Catholicism was born. This faith while the empire fell, continued to spread and grow through all the areas and regions that Rome had influence over, and this Christian church was united as the Roman Catholic Church. Let's move forward a little bit then to the year 1054. This Christian church, the the Roman Catholic Church, has a major schism. There's a major break, and there are some disagreements that were theological. For example, whether they should use leavened or unleavened bread. We've been having this argument in altar guilds for years and years and years, people. This isn't new, right? It's a thousand years old argument. Leavened or unleavened bread. 
Um, but there was also political reasons for this split, and of course a lot of it was due to power and authority, and who had the power. Some people, the, the Church of the West, thought that the Pope had power over everyone. The people in the East felt like it was legitimate to give the same power to their Pope in the East. And so they ended up breaking into two, two, two churches. We fast forward again, and the year is 1517. And a young monk named Martin Luther began a deep reading of the Book of Romans, along with a pilgrimage to Rome and some observation of very questionable practices at that time of the Roman Catholic Church. And these all surrounded corrupt leaders and the misuse of power and money, partly through the selling of indulgences. So Luther, with the 95 Theses, made public his concerns, and then that began a fast and furious, pa fast and furious pace towards the Reformation. And that's what we're acknowledging today. Of course, it's important to know that there were a number of other church leaders who also had the same concerns that Luther did. They also read Romans and other New Testament readings and used those to support their concerns. They read that we were saved by God's grace only, so that the selling of indulgences to build that cathedral in Rome wasn't quite honest, because people would do anything to ensure their loved one's salvation and entrance into heaven and forgiveness. So the, ch the church took advantage of that and raised money for the building of the cathedral. However, back then, these monks and priests that had concerns too didn't quite get the Reformation started. They were either burned at the stake or killed in another variety of awful ways or at worst, I mean at best, they were excommunicated, but for them that was like being kicked out of heaven. And they were kicked out for their beliefs and the Reformation didn't go anywhere until all the other social political things changed at the same time. The explosion of new knowledge and art through the Renaissance period, exploration around the world, the invention of the printing press made it possible for Luther to be heard, the development of the city-state kind of a way of being instead of the feudal lands. All of these things protected Luther in a way no other reformer had been been protected. And so in your bulletins is another little paragraph about Luther, but don't get it out right now. Wait until after the sermon to read it, okay? And if you're still awake now and able to do math while you're listening, you've probably noticed that almost all of the events that I've spoken of are every 500 years, except for Jeremiah, we'll give him a, we'll give him a hundred grace period because, you know, they had a different calendar than we did. So, if we take 1517 and fast forward another 500 years, that's about the time we're in right now, 15, 2017 or even 2022, this year. There are a number of theologians and other scholars who've anticipated and felt the changing of the church once again, another 500 years later. Phyllis Tickle is a well-known and respected author who writes about this phenomenon, and she states, every 500 years, ago, 500 years or so, Christianity has gone through an upheaval, she said, because the old answer no longer holds true for a large number of people, and the church at large has to accommodate. 500 years ago, the upheaval was the Reformation, when Protestantism was born. There are now more than 37,000 different denominations worldwide. And that's from the two that existed back then. The article I used for a brief synopsis of Tickle's book about this 500-year Reformation history also says this. Christianity is in the midst of a major shift, according to the scholar and author Phyllis Tickle, and that shift could involve making more room for the Holy Spirit. Tickle spoke at an event in 2014 in Columbia and focused on one question, what is the future of faith? Tickle said that no one knows for sure what the future of Christianity would look like, but she uses history to demonstrate how it has been reshaped through the years and explains how the past and present can give us some idea of what the future might hold. She said religion has an obligation to the culture to answer the question, how now shall we live? Or put another way, who has the authority? Who is calling the shots? 
So now I'm sure you're saying to yourself, okay, Pastor Heather, that's really fascinating. And the part about being the church being in a major shift is a little scary and unnerving. So could you please tell us today how this relates to the gospel? And my response is, okay. I think the best way to tell you is this. We're going to just take a second so you can see my shirt. For those of you in the back who might not be able to see it, it says, sin boldly. On the back it says, but believe and rejoice in Christ even more boldly. This is a quote from Martin Luther in, 15, in, the, in the Reformation. In his reading of Romans, what took Martin Luther away, in his reading of Romans, what Martin Luther took away was that we needn't be worried about our salvation because that has been taken care of by Jesus Christ. God's grace through our faith in Christ is truly what saves us, so we are free. Free from this sin that John speaks of, in John 8. While we may live in a free country where religion is practiced freely, we are never fully freed from sin unless we live in God's grace. Of course, Martin Luther doesn't mean go on sinning then, which is what the people on the airplane when I walked down the aisle with my backpack on in college all thought, oh, please don't let her be sitting next to us. Because I had this big sin boldly across my shirt, across my chest. This is not what we're supposed to do. We're not supposed to just go on sinning. Paul writes the same question. What then, shall we go on sinning? No. But the point is that because of this new covenant that Jeremiah speaks of that God makes with us through Jesus is unbreakable. And so we are free to live free from the worry of sin, which then allows us to focus on loving our neighbor and not so much on the navel gazing that we do to make sure we're good people and doing the right things and getting ourselves into heaven because it's not what we can do, right? We all fall short of God's glory, but Christ has saved us from that sin so that we can be free to love God and others. So as Phyllis Tickle's question goes, what is the future of the Christian faith and how now shall we live? She highlights the strong connection that religion has to all aspects of culture, and she says that typically, roughly about 150 years before a major religious shift, they're full of sociological changes. If you think about all the changes that we've gone through very rapidly in just 100, 150 years or so now, you can kind of see that. And during these sociological changes, old ideas are broken down to a number of church leaders We've been experiencing a lot of changes in the church and wondering how to be leaders. And I think that maybe even church members like you and everywhere else, people are feeling it. Where is everyone? Where are all the young people? Why is it so hard to get people to even come to church, much less be involved? What does it mean that sometimes our youth declare that they're more spiritual than they are religious? And then recently... What's taken a toll is COVID. There's also changes even further back that have taken a toll. For instance, 150 years ago, some scholars would say is when our shift began because people were starting to realize that the Bible couldn't be used to justify things like, say, slavery. And then in the, after the World War II period, families started having both parents go to work. And then the invention of birth control came along and a family system and the way that their roles were changed. And that's not necessarily a blame on anybody, but there was a difference in where faith was primarily taught. And then Andy Root, um, the the person who does the podcast that we talk about in my Sunday school, um, he gives a compelling number of reasons why even more now in the last 20 years there's a shift. I'm not going to go into all of those because he has a number of them, but you can come to my Sunday school class. And again, then we come back to this COVID thing, and it's really changed the way we worship and who comes and who doesn't anymore. So now I know you're thinking, Pastor Heather, what is the future of the church going to look like? Will our church survive? And my answer is 
I have no idea. But this is what I do know, even though it's a little frightening to think, what if the church doesn't exist in the future? I would also say that just because the church is changing and our practices of faith may look very different in 20 or 30 years, God's new covenant with us that he shares with Jeremiah, again, I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. This covenant, 2,500 years, is unchangeable. It remains true since 600 B.C., and through four major shifts in the church and how worship is done and how faith is practiced throughout our history. We are and will always be set free from the slavery of sin because of what Christ has done for us. So the question remains, how will we live? How will we practice our faith boldly without fear because we believe and rejoice in Christ even more boldly? Amen.